Have you ever watched a film and as soon as you finished it, you were completely blown away by it? It's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? Once it's all over and you sit back and reflect on what you just watched and you can't stop thinking about it for days? Well, I had that experience just a few weeks ago. For a long time, I've been trying to go through my ever-evolving list of movies I've always wanted to watch. And this particular film has been on my list for a while, but I've never gotten a chance to watch until now. And once I finished it, I was so impressed with it, I needed to make this video. And what film is that, you may ask? Well, you see the title of the video already so you know what it is. I'm gonna be talking about Space Jam 2, a new legacy. I mean Sorcerer. I'm gonna be talking about Sorcerer. Sorcerer is a film from 1977 by acclaimed director and renowned psychopath William Friedkin. The film is about four men, all from different parts of the world, living in South America to hide from their dark past. One is a hitman from Mexico, another is a Palestinian terrorist, another is a businessman accused of fraud in France, and the last is an Irish gang member from America. They are each offered a job by an oil company representative to drive two trucks across the treacherous roads of South America. The reason he wants them to drive is because there are gallons of nitroglycerin that need to be brought over, and these packages could explode at any given moment. So the four men attempt to work together, because if anything happens to the trucks, they all die. Now for me explaining that premise, you would think, God, that sounds like a really stressful experience. Well, you'll be excited to hear that the movie is three times worse than what you could ever imagine in terms of stress, and it's f***ing amazing. This is honestly one of the best thrillers to have come out from the 70s, and it's a shame that it wasn't a hit when it first came out. Why is that? Well, before I go in depth on the movie itself, I'm gonna give you some history on the making of this movie. The director, William Friedkin, was fresh off the success of making two fantastic films. One was The French Connection in 1971, and a little horror movie called The Exorcist in 1973. French Connection won Best Picture at the Oscars, and The Exorcist was a huge box office success and was nominated for Best Picture, which for a supernatural horror film to be nominated for any kind of Oscar is kind of insane. If you look at the Best Picture nominees from every year the Oscars have been around, almost none of them got any sort of attention by the Academy. The only other horror movie that got this sort of recognition was Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> So Friedkin did the unthinkable when he made The Exorcist. So after making two incredibly successful films back to back, he had the opportunity to make whatever movie he wanted, and with that, he decided to do his own version of the 1953 French film, The Wages of Fear. Just a side note, I have not seen Wages of Fear yet, but whatever I do, you'll see it on my box link in the description. The film took several years to make and was a production hell. The film's initial budget was about $15 million, about $71 million in today's money, but after some major production issues in William Friedkin's ego, we'll get to that later, the film ballooned to $22 million, adjusted for inflation that's over $100 million in 2022. And when the film came out, it was a huge flop. It got negative reviews from critics and made only $9 million at the box office. The main reason it didn't do so well is because it had difficulties competing with a little movie that came out a month beforehand. You might have heard of it. It's called, uh... <coughs> Uh, Star Wars. And after a while, the movie faded into obscurity, which is an absolute travesty because this movie is about as perfect a thriller as you could ever ask for. The film is separated into four parts, one being a series of stories that don't seem to connect each other at first, where we see these four men from different parts of the world falling into these dark paths of crime. And then the second part is where we see the stories connect. We see their lives as they're hanging out in South America and you get this fantastic sense of what the environment is like before they get on their mission. You get this scene where an oil rig explodes and the way the scene is directed, it's so gritty and realistic. It gives you an excellent sense of unease even before they start driving the trucks. I can't show too much of it because I don't want this video age restricted, but the scene afterwards where soldiers are bringing back the charred bodies of the people that died at the oil rig, it's so disturbing and the acting from everyone is so amazing it almost feels like a documentary. <laughs> Which makes sense because William Friedkin had experience with documentary filmmaking before he got into Hollywood. First made documentaries? Yes. 
First documentary I did was uh, against the death penalty. It was about a young man who was on death row for seven years when I met him, and I made the film to try and save him from the electric chair. Also in this part, this is when the four men are hired to carry the nitroglycerin across the jungle. What makes a lot of these moments so great is that we've already gotten a ton of time with them in the last part in showing their backstories. So seeing them all come together and start working on bringing the shipment over makes these scenes even better, because we actually care about the characters. And after that is where the actual journey begins. Now at this point in the film, I was enjoying it quite a bit, but didn't really know where it was going. These last two parts blew me away. Come on! No! Come on! With so much context given up till this point, the third segment of the film is one of the most intense and stressful experiences I've ever had with a movie, and I mean that in the best way possible. Their entire journey is filled with so many challenges and moments where you don't know what's going to happen. The tension is so high and everybody from the actors to the direction to the crew makes some of the most tense-filled and amazing set pieces I've ever seen. Primarily the scene that is most well known, the bridge scene. Holy crap, where do I even start? The crew have to drive both trucks across this bridge, only there are some minor Minor problems like the fact that the bridge is on the verge of collapse and they are in the middle of a rainstorm. This whole scene is done masterfully. First off, the sound design is amazing. The rain overtaking half the dialogue and the sound of the creaking bridge makes everything sound so chaotic, which adds to the suspense. <laughs> Throughout the whole movie, you're on the edge of your seat because you're fully aware that the nitroglycerin is ready to explode in both trucks. So with them being in one of the most perilous situations you can imagine, the tension is almost unbearable, especially during some moments with the second truck. <laughs> God, this movie's so f***ing good. Which brings me to another one of my favorite scenes in the movie. After driving through all this terrain, and just after they get across the bridge, their path is blocked by a gigantic tree, and there's no way to move it. They realize that they are all stuck with nowhere to go, and the acting in this scene is amazing. All their reactions feel so unbelievably real. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about this segment is what makes this movie amazing. I love how some story elements from the first segment are interconnected in later parts of the film. Near the end of segment 3, Serrano and Martinez are having a casual conversation while driving the truck. During this entire scene, we get a shot of one of the wheels as it's driving, so you get a feeling that something's about to go wrong. During the conversation, Serrano shows Martinez a watch that's been given to him by his wife, which was also shown at the beginning. My wife. Just my wife. The day she gave me this was the last day I saw her. And as soon as you let your guard down, as soon as everything seems to be okay, this happens. <laughs> Holy sh**. This moment made my jaw drop. Not because of their deaths, I presumed at least a couple of them at some point were going to die, but how sudden it was, how unceremoniously they were killed off. For a movie as suspenseful and intense as it is, the way this is executed is just perfection, and also a case of good writing, setting up something that might seem unimportant at first, but then having it have a huge dramatic moment later on. Something like this happens later on in the film, when Roy Scheider is talking to one of the oil representatives after being the only one that survived the journey, and he is given a letter that was written by Serrano earlier in segment two. Paris, it could take a month. Yes, just keep it for me. I'll take care of it. Now I love Roy Scheider. He's in my favorite movie of all time and a bunch of other movies I enjoy like French Connection. But this scene is probably my favorite performance he's ever given. His reaction to the letter conveys so much with no dialogue and the sound of the bar adds such an ominous atmosphere that's hard to convey. Just watch. <laughs> The look of him realizing all hope is lost and that sudden feeling of, aw oh, f**k, I'm dead. It's just... 
Oh god, you're so good. And gets even better because Roy Scheider's story at the beginning of the film ends fantastically. Realizing his fate, he sees a woman scrubbing the floors and has to dance with her in his final moments. Outside a taxi drives up to the entrance of the bar, and it's two dudes. The same dudes that were shown at Roy Scheider's segment in the beginning. They walk inside, and one single gunshot is heard until the credits appear, showing through all these people, no matter how much you try to escape the past, the past always comes back to haunt you. It's so simple, but it's so effective. Effective. Which is the best way I can describe this film. Simple, but incredibly effective. Everybody involved with this film was at the top of their game and was quoted as saying they were trying to make the best film they could ever make. And William Friedkin has said out of all of the films he's made, he considers this his favorite, which is amazing for a guy with his filmography. It's kind of similar to John Carpenter's The Thing, another film where the crew thought they were making the best film they could. It tanked at the box office, got negative reviews, but over the years has been reevaluated as an underrated masterpiece and a personal favorite from the director. I think we can all agree that William Freakin is a pretty strong director, but I think it's appropriate now to talk about the elephant in the room. You know how I said earlier that William Freakin is a renowned psychopath? Sorcerer is a film from 1977 by acclaimed director and renowned psychopath William Friedkin. Well, you know how I also said William Freakin is good at displaying realism in his films? Well, he kind of has a thing where he tries to make things too real. For example, in The French Connection, that car chase scene that movie's well known for? Yeah, they shot that without any permits whatsoever. So some of the shots when you see cars swerving and people moving out of the way, those aren't extras. Those are real people. There's realistic, and then there's just putting lives in danger. Even though this is a great film, it's hard for me to support the ideas of the director when filming stuff like this. And it gets even worse when it comes to The Exorcist, with some on-set scenarios including shooting a gun in the air so we can get an intense reaction from the cast, and telling the stuntman to pull Ellen Burstyn twice as hard on the floor for a more violent reaction. That is also crossing a line. And surprise, surprise, there was also stuff like that in the making of this movie. That bridge scene I was talking about before? Yeah, that one scene took months to shoot and was a nightmare to make, and the bridge was so rickety and broken that the trucks fell over multiple times during shoots. While filming the movie, 50 crew members had to go to the hospital for some sort of injury or gangrene, and some were fired by the director because of on-set conflicts. Speaking of conflicts, he had massive problems with the studio, to the point where he would throw producers off set when making the movie, and use some of their photos to the crew to give them an idea of what the evil oil executives are like. So yeah, if that doesn't prove that William Freakin's a bit of a maniac, I don't know what will. Even though there are definitely some aspects of the director that I disagree with, that still doesn't change my feelings of the film as a whole. It's riveting as all hell, the characters are interesting and engaging, it's well shot, well directed, well acted, it's just so damn good. One thing I haven't touched on yet, and I'm surprised I haven't, is the score. It's definitely a product of its time, but I still love it a lot. The score is done by Tangerine Dream, an electronic group that have also done scores for other movies like Risky Business, Thief, and Near Dark. While the score is used minimally, anytime it comes up, it fits just right. So that's another thing to add to this movie's never-ending list of praises from me. Check it out if you have the chance. It's the highest praise I've given for a film so far, and if you have a chance to purchase it online or buy it on Blu-ray, you're in for one hell of a time. I would give it five stars out of five. 